The end of days. New Testament prophecies suggest that as a final apocalypse approaches, many devout Christians may suddenly disappear in a supernatural event known as the rapture. In the blink of an eye, millions are gone. Massive pileups occur as cars hurtle out of control with no one behind the wheel. An airliner on final approach suddenly has no pilot. Chaos erupts everywhere. But this unsettling event is only the beginning of what will be the most turbulent period in human history. For thousands of years, prophets around the world have predicted the end of days. More than one suggests the apocalypse is fast approaching. We call this theoretical convergence between doomsday prophecies and today's events the Nostradamus effect. Prophecies within the New Testament predict a period of extraordinary tribulation. Seven years of mounting calamities climaxing with the end of days. They foretell that we will experience unprecedented suffering and great cataclysms that may wipe out mankind. It will be worse than any natural disaster we've ever heard of because it'll affect everybody all around the globe. But before this great time of suffering begins, according to some interpreters, the Bible points to a way out, the rapture. They claim that this event promises to transform believers into spirit bodies who will suddenly and literally be taken up in the air, escaping the pain and sorrow to come. suggests disaster for those who remain. By its nature, the prophecy of the rapture defies rational analysis. The rapture would be a supernatural event a miracle orchestrated by a supreme being, and as such is a matter strictly of faith. Even so, we will examine whether cultures other than Christianity have similar prophecies of salvation, and what the real world consequences of such an event would be for the people left behind. We'll begin by exploring what the rapture is and when people think it will take place. There are controversial interpretations and cross-cultural references in any study of the rapture, a study that begins with the Bible itself. According to many biblical interpreters, Several prophets in both the Old and New Testaments foretell the rapture. They believe the Apostle Paul promised this miracle to early Christians in approximately 53 AD. We who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Paul talks about people being gathered up and gathered up in the Greek means to be snatched, grabbed suddenly. And it's translated into the Latin as rapturo, where we get the word rapture. We shall not all die, he said, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. From these brief biblical allusions comes the modern concept of people being lifted bodily into heaven. 
In terms of Christian theology, this is an idea that's really articulated only in the last couple hundred years. Now, is this possible? It's based on very thin biblical evidence. But many researchers believe the biblical evidence is compelling. Among the passages they cite is the prophecy of John of Patmos in the book of Revelation, written around 68 AD. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. This passage speaks to a crucial issue debated for centuries, whether true believers will be taken into heaven before the disasters that mark the apocalypse, also known as the tribulation, or whether they will be raptured after they have endured the tribulation. In other words, when will the rapture happen? Pre-tribulation rapture essentially teaches that the rapture happens before what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation, the seven-year period of trial that comes upon the earth. Post-tribulation theory suggests that the rapture happens at the very end of the Great Tribulation when Jesus returns to rule and reign upon the earth. Believers do not agree among themselves whether the virtuous will be raptured before or after the tribulation. And these opposing theories have been a contentious flashpoint the reason? Only if the rapture occurs before the tribulation will those spirited away be spared the nightmares described in Revelation. Jesus says, I will keep you from the hour of darkness that will fall upon the world. He says, I will keep you from, not I will bring you through it or protect you through it, but I will keep you from it. And thus, that is a pretty clear indication of the rapture. Many Christians believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. But others are convinced that the rapture will not happen until mankind has endured the horrors of the tribulation. When Christ comes down into the clouds of the sky, he's left heaven. So if he's come down from heaven, it's time to restore everything, which means he will not come down pre-tribulation. I believe that the pre-tribulation rapture actually holds more water than the post-tribulation rapture for a number of reasons. For example, the post-tribulation rapture has a timing problem where Jesus comes down upon the earth and he snatches his believers up to heaven, but then he comes back down to earth to rule and reign. So he's sort of two places at one time, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And that gives more credibility to the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. But it really is a matter of interpretation. Pre-tribulation rapture is more popular today, even though a post-tribulation rapture idea was more popular in the past. And I think it has a lot to do with the American worldview. It's a sense of almost entitlement that we are, we're too good to go through this time of wrath. But what do other religions say about the rapture, if anything? Do other religions and belief systems even have a rapture or rapture-like event? Investigators have discovered parallels. Although nobody has a definitive answer about the rapture's timing, these other cultures provide a context for what Revelation promises. Islam teaches that believers in its God, Allah, will find refuge with the Prophet Muhammad protected from a wind of destruction which will kill all the remaining people left behind. Islam holds very similar ideas about the last days as does Christianity. Now, this is not surprising. Islam emerges out of a very Christian context. Muhammad would have known of Christianity very well. And Muhammad uses many of the Christian texts Interpreters also see parallels to the rapture in the prophecies of America's Hopi Indians. Hopi written and oral traditions characterize the world's end as a day of purification when the Hopi will be flown to other planets in ships without wings. The Hopi had predicted it would be a time of unrest and chaos and disorder. And I think, again, if you look at the news, we're seeing that. 
scholars acknowledge that, at least in these cases, the prophecies appear to converge. But is there also convergence between the prophecies and current events, signaling that the rapture and the end of days may be imminent? If so, then what are the consequences for those who will be left behind? Is there reason to believe that the end of days biblical prophecy may be happening in our lifetime? Believers in the rapture look for signs that the sudden disappearance of the faithful may occur soon. What would the consequences be if millions of people suddenly vanished off the face of the earth? It's a very complex, multi-layered issue within Christian uh, thinking today. However, the power of, the, of this idea is very attractive. Attractive to some, horrifying to others. People who are left behind and realize that their own loved ones uh, have disappeared, I think will be the most horrified people on earth. And then the, the question will be, is it too late for me? Pinpointing whether or not the rapture will happen in our generation is a more fundamental challenge. Some interpreters point to a prophecy made by Jesus Christ in the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus tells his disciples that a number of things are going to happen. He gives them signs to look for in regard to his second coming the end of the age, the judgment that was going to take place. And then he gives them a parable. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near. Is this the sign that will tell believers the end times are near? According to some scholars, the fig tree is a metaphor for Israel. They interpret the blossoming of the fig tree to be the re-emergence of Israel as a nation in 1948. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Some interpreters suggest this means that the rapture and end of days will happen soon, before the generation that witnessed the rebirth of Israel passes away. In other words, within decades or even years. Other Bible experts say the fig tree does not represent Israel, but merely a cycle of nature. As proof, they cite another of Christ's parables. In Luke, he says, when you see all the trees bloom, you know that summer is near. It's not just the fig tree. Kind of messes up the interpretation that the fig tree represents Israel. Despite these differences in interpretation, Many Christians believe that the rapture will occur just before the onset of a seven-year period of unimaginable turmoil known as the Tribulation. In fact, they believe the shocking nature of the rapture itself could trigger the first wave of turbulence. Suddenly, there would be bedlam, chaos, panic. That would be a normal response. The day after the rapture, the grocery stores are going to be so bombarded, there will be nothing on the shelf within hours. And the only thing the police would be able to do instantly is clear the streets and call martial law. And they'll have to, they'll have to put in effect a curfew. They'll, they'll stop people. Nobody will be able to leave their houses after dusk. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be hell on earth. I can imagine there'll be looting and pillaging. Uh, just as there is uh, in, in war situations or rioting situations. Imagined scenarios in the wake of the rapture include millions of abandoned homes and businesses, in which fires swiftly consume entire neighborhoods. Scenarios similar to the chaos and panic that followed Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Fire departments, their manpower already committed elsewhere, would be unable to respond to any but the most severe blazes. 
circumstances reminiscent of wildfires that have plagued huge swaths of Los Angeles. Emergency managers have to make some tough decisions um, because the goal is to save lives and save property um, and not lose your firefighters in the process. This is where the crown lies heavy on those at the head of emergency operations. If large numbers of people were to go missing and critical services stretched to the limit, it's likely the strain would worsen the trauma. They're gonna be angry. There's gonna be resentment. Uh, the extra hours is gonna cause problems with concentration. For the millions who remain, if the rapture actually occurred, the horrors might be compounded by large numbers of travel-related accidents and deaths. The premise of the rapture implies that motorists would disappear from behind the wheels of their cars, causing massive multi-vehicle pileups. If this were to occur, the wreckage might be so widespread that it would block freeways, causing instant gridlock. This happens even during relatively modest fender benders in our busiest cities. One of the things that we've become very dependent upon in this country and across the world is our mobility. So if you had an event that effectively closed a lot of the roadways, we would have some real challenges. In a time of unprecedented chaos, confusion, when you don't know where these people went, why they're gone, what happened to them. You know, you're wondering, did something horrible happen to them? Were they kidnapped? What happened to all of these loved ones? And who's gonna fill the gaps? You're talking about huge gaps. We're gonna have to compensate. If the rapture actually happened, some airline pilots might vanish in flight as well as air traffic controllers, leaving planes in danger of falling from the skies. And then if this happens during rush hour and people disappear from behind the wheel of their car, uh, airline pilots disappear out of the cockpit, uh, bus drivers, whatever, um, people who work in the power companies and police officers, firemen, it's gonna be awful. And all the things that you could imagine happening will happen. It'll be the most terrifying and chaotic event in the history of mankind. Emergency service responders would be quickly overwhelmed by the sheer devastation. When you're dealing with paramedics, people who are in the caring professions, doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, one of the things that happens when they're in situations of overwhelming stress is something called compassion stress or compassion fatigue. But no matter how hard emergency professionals do their job, the chaos will be insurmountable, according to the prophecy. Believers in the rapture say that all the while, the world will make futile efforts to understand and cope. And I think the news media will probably try to uh, to explain it away from some natural or, or uh, scientific way. Government officials might explain it away as a terrorist attack using some kind of newfangled technology that we've uh, heretofore is unheard of. To many, the rapture is fantasy. But for those who accept it, the ramifications are disturbing. They believe that once the shock of the rapture and its aftermath has worn off, a desperate struggle for survival will begin. If the prophecy of the rapture is realized, the consequences stagger the imagination. In the blink of an eye, millions of people would vanish from the earth. Those who remain would be confused, terrified, and perhaps be in mortal danger. 
But not everyone believes that the rapture will be a literal event, that the doomsday countdown to apocalypse will have begun. The texts are subject to interpretation. According to some, the righteous will abruptly disappear, no matter where they are or what they are doing. The rapture actually speaks to people's emotions, which is one of the reasons why it's so hotly contested. There are people who just want to see their kids grow up. They want to see you know, their sons and daughters get married. And a lot of people feel like they don't want the rapture to happen immediately. But other biblical scholars contend that the rapture's premise, in which some are chosen and others are not, only adds to current social conflict. One of the most troubling aspects of this obsession with Bible prophecy is its divisiveness. The way that it's used to tar people as evil and to identify a few of us as good, those who will survive. And to be obsessed with drawing lines that separate people instead of working for a society that unifies and takes care of people. This is a land of promise. Still, many believers look forward to the rapture anticipating their own rescue by God. But according to some interpretations, the New Testament says that millions of dead will also be resurrected at this time. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Some Bible scholars interpret this passage from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians as meaning that everyone who has died believing in Christ would be raised from the dead. People that are in the dust of the earth are raised to life. So you get this picture that people are popping out of graves to meet the Lord in the air, this resurrection of the dead. The question is, will we see actual corpses and graveyards just rising into the sky and people flying up from their graves. Understandably, many are skeptical. But if the rapture were to occur, it follows that the sudden disappearance of millions would result in chaos and destruction. After the immediate shock, long-term repercussions of a rapture-like event would begin to have an impact. Hospitals would be overwhelmed. Doctors assigned to triage duties would have an all but impossible task. Triage is a French word that means to turn things into threes. And it's a prioritization system. And the idea is there are some people who are already dead, or no matter what you do to save them, the chances of their survival is very, very low. And then you have another group of people who are wounded, but they can get treatment at some point later, a broken limb or something like this, where if you don't get treatment within the first hour, you're still going to live. And then there's another group of people that if they don't get immediate intervention, they'll probably join those who have perished. What's very critical during those times is for the caregivers to debrief what's going on and to give each other support, to give each other accolades, because they're being heroic under difficult situations. Law enforcement agencies may discover they are woefully understaffed, unable to protect the public. Do police then cordon off a portion of town and say, you're on your own, we can't really deal with it? No. They do have to make strategic decisions about how can we deploy the resources that we have available to do the best job of serving and protecting our citizenry. In this imagined post-rapture world, many citizens may realize, perhaps too late, that they must rely on themselves for protection. All the services we're used to, all the peace and tranquility and convenience of travel and communication, all that's going to be up for grabs. If the rapture happens, society might begin to fray, much as it did briefly during the New York City blackout in 1977. We live in an area we all have where there's been a brownout or a blackout, where lightning has maybe taken power out for a day or two. 
Some people live through this for a week or two. And everything in the freezer gets spoiled and people don't have water and so it's like they're living a century ago instead of having plumbing and doors and all that type of thing. That's going to be just a tiny little taste of the chaos that will ensue when so many people are gone. If an event like the rapture happens, it might force officials to declare major cities to be disaster areas. If the governor does proclaim a state of disaster, they can then access National Guard resources. And that's most often done to facilitate logistics, transportation, and some of those other elements that the Army is so very good at. But in this hypothetical scenario, resources would be stretched to the breaking point. I would say a lot more people would live off the land. It'll be a desperate struggle for survival. This scenario could worsen if officials blame the calamities caused by the rapture on terrorism, a move that could exacerbate international tensions. The disappearance of a mass number of people would most certainly put the world into chaos. The prophecies of the Bible, Islam, and the Hopi, do they all foretell the same incredible event? If the biblical prophecy is correct, a mysterious figure will emerge after the rapture, igniting global turmoil and the end of the world. If the supernatural event called the rapture occurs as prophesied in the Bible, millions of people will suddenly vanish. This event is, according to many, merely the beginning of the end for those who remain on earth. But if the rapture is the first stage of the period known as the tribulation, what sequence of events can we expect? Some Bible researchers see clues to how the prophecy will unfold in the Gospel of Matthew which records the words of Jesus spoken 2,000 years ago. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. The normal human response to large groups of people that you know and love and are attached to suddenly leave without the ability to say goodbye, without the ability to understand what happened, it would be devastating. The end times is going to be occasioned by a rapture, usually then by seven years of tribulation or the trying of those who are left behind. The trying can involve famine, war, and uh, riots, and all kinds of crimes of the wicked uh, on earth, as well as natural disasters. The Bible suggests the events that are prophesied to follow the rapture, bloody persecution and global catastrophe, may further decimate humankind. They point to the visions of the prophet Isaiah. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. It will be a, a time of a terrible judgment. So it's going to be a time of horror. This time of judgment and war, foretold in the book of Revelation, is the seven-year era of horrors known as the Tribulation. Revelation says it follows the rise of a charismatic world leader known as the Beast, a man of evil and deception other prophets have identified as the Antichrist. I think the rapture sets up the, uh, the appearance of the Antichrist in, in a dramatic way um, and it and becomes very useful to him because of the chaos that ensues. People are going to be so terrified, they're going to be looking for somebody to save them from this horror. The Antichrist is what many scholars identify as the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And he rides out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. I mean, we're talking about the greatest villain of all time, and yet he's so attractive and persuasive and articulate that people think he's God. He's a political leader. He's a military commander. He's a diplomatic leader. And he's a, he's a, he's a violent, evil person. 
Interpreters of the prophecy say the Antichrist will unleash unimaginable cruelty upon humanity and lead the world to destruction. The Antichrist is probably here. And this man may not even know he is the Antichrist. Many believe we are moving closer to the beginning of this end of days prophecy, as global catastrophes appear to be taking an ever greater toll in human life. Revelation also speaks of great natural disasters during tribulation. And there were flashes of lightning, voices, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones dropped on men from heaven. Everything seems to be bigger and, and more dramatic than ever before. Natural disasters seem to be um, more intense. More sophisticated scientific equipment and better news coverage have created the impression for many that more earthquakes are happening now than ever before. More recently, in 2009, catastrophic undersea earthquakes triggered tsunamis and landslides that killed over a thousand in Indonesia and Samoa. Recent research done in La Jolla, California shows that if a large enough earthquake were to happen along the southern San Andreas, it could trigger a super volcanic eruption at Long Valley. I mean, not only would we be dealing with a major disaster that would economically cripple the United States, but something that could trigger a global disaster. Does the onslaught of disasters in recent years support the claim by some that we are on the brink of the rapture? Some people believe that we're in the last days because of all the sinfulness of the world, the degeneration of morals, the decay of society, the troubles in the Middle East. Historically, you look at the Middle East and it's always been in trouble. There's always been conflict there. These are not signs of the last days. Just because things are bad now does not mean it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Yet many believers in the rapture still focus on the Middle East for signs that the prophecy is converging with recent events. What's intriguing about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the, the president of Iran, is that he believes that we are in fact living in the last days of history. He said upon coming into office in Iran in the summer of 2005 that we were probably just two or three years away from the return of the Islamic Messiah known as the Mahdi, or the 12th Imam, or the hidden Imam. Many religions foresee a cataclysmic end of the world, perhaps caused by a global nuclear war. Could such an apocalypse be triggered by a devout head of state who perceives himself as fulfilling a holy prophecy? For the first time in human history, you have the leaders of a country feverishly trying to build, buy, or steal nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them with a theology, an end times theology, that's driving them to create a genocide in the world. We've never seen this happen before. We can't say for certain that it's prophetic, but it's certainly apocalyptic. And the question becomes, what happens next? If the Bible is to be taken literally, then Revelation is clear about mankind's future and the rise of the Antichrist. People will die. And so whether mobs are incited or they're thrown into the furnace or they're thrown to the lions or they bring back the guillotine, I don't know exactly, but it'll be gruesome. Revelation's message is that even for those who refuse to worship the Antichrist, there is no guarantee of survival. They're probably gonna have to set up their own individual system with fellow believers if they're growing food to share it with each other and making things to do that with each other and that sort of thing, it could be that some of them are gonna to have to try to hide out places. So it's gonna be difficult for people and a real challenge to them. There's no doubt about it. 
The destructive events orchestrated by the Antichrist, as prophesied in the Book of Revelation, will climax with the return of Jesus. Some believe the return of the Messiah may be a calamitous moment for mankind, as Jesus compared his second coming to Noah's great flood. Jesus went on to say that in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the question is, which group of people did the flood take away from the earth? It was all the unsaved, the wicked people that were taken from the earth in judgment by the flood. As with Noah and the great flood, Believers in the rapture claim that this miraculous event will spare believers the pain and sorrow of a final apocalypse. But they say for those who are not taken, the living may envy the dead. According to some interpretations of the Bible's end times prophecy, vast numbers of people all over the world will vanish in the rapture. Instantly changed to spirit form, they may be spared the suffering of tribulation and the apocalypse that follows. There are a lot of people out there who would believe that the rapture is a fairy tale. Uh, you have people flying up into the sky and graves opened and it just sounds like a crazy story. But the millions who accept the rapture as a valid prophecy, and one soon to be realized, may be torn between expectation and fear. The rapture is the opening gun in a race to Armageddon that ends with Jesus and Satan battling for the souls of mankind. The rapture is both a terrible event, a horrible event, undescribably horrible event, and also at the same time an undescribably thrilling, joyous occasion, depending upon which side one stands as an individual. If the rapture were actually to occur, would those left behind to face the horrors of the tribulation have any hope of survival? I'm not sure that it's possible for somebody to have much hope during the tribulation when their loved ones have gone, when all these judgments are being rained down, when there's such chaos and terror. This will be worldwide. In fact, one of the prophecies says that at one point during the tribulation, the entire world has an earthquake that levels the mountains and puts the entire earth on the same distance above sea level. According to some interpreters, the book of Revelation describes a chilling series of disasters. They believe pandemics will wipe out millions. Climate change will bring scorching heat. A third of Earth's waters will be poisoned. There are a number of signs that Jesus and the Hebrew prophets and the New Testament apostles lay out that will be indicators that we are in the last days and that return of Jesus is coming. Among them, we'll see wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Just as a woman has to go through a period of suffering before she delivers a new life into the world, so planet Earth is gonna to have to go through seven years of severe suffering before the new messianic age is born in the world when Messiah is here ruling the world on behalf of God. Some claim that during the tribulation, believers will look again to the Bible in hopes that their covenant with God will offer protection. We know in Exodus chapter 12 that the Israelites were spared from the angel of death by putting the blood over the lintel and the doorposts. And there's lots of scripture that talk about God's people being sealed. According to the book of Revelation, the servants of God will receive a seal that enables them to survive. 
do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. During the Great Tribulation, God is literally supernaturally protecting his people. People may think that after the rapture happens, they're doomed completely, and that's the end, but it's really not. Some believe that as the tribulation deepens, devout followers of many religions will rely on their faith as a shield against death, knowing their salvation is secured. According to the Bible, the Antichrist will seek out and destroy anyone who does not worship him. They may lose their earthly life during the tribulation hour because they may be martyred by the Antichrist, but they will gain their eternal life. The cost of being saved in the tribulation period is to become a martyr and to die for your faith. There may be a few that will escape death, but the majority that are converted to Christ during the tribulation period will be put to death. But skeptics argue that the millions who accept Revelation as a blueprint for our future have it all wrong. They contend that the scenarios of the rapture and the tribulation as literal events stem from a misinterpretation of the biblical text. According to this view, Revelation was a message intended only to first century Christians, a commentary on an era in which the church faced horrific persecution. I read the book of Revelation as a book that's full of metaphors and allegory that isn't necessarily always to be taken literally. The desire to take these texts too literally, I think, leads a lot of people astray and has resulted in all sorts of misinterpretations and false interpretations of these texts. It's led people to see, you know, the end of the world here and there and everywhere. Despite such arguments, belief in the rapture and the tribulation persists. A frequent message from religious leaders extols followers to be prepared. A passage from the New Testament book of Thessalonians crystallizes their sense of urgency. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The idea is that we don't have to be surprised by the coming of Jesus. He told us, we'll see the signs. Pay attention to the signs. Get ready. When you see massive global wars, when you see regional wars, when you see revolutions, when you see earthquakes and famines and plagues and the persecution of the church, Jesus said, know that I'm near, right at the door. According to interpreters of the prophecy, if you see on the news that millions of people have vanished, this will be when the end begins. I would liken Bible prophecy in many ways to the National Weather Service seeing Hurricane Katrina coming. The prophets saw themselves as forecasting the weather, as it were, major storms in advance so that people could get to safety. And the question is, will people listen to the weather forecasters and get to safety in time, or will they be hit by a storm they just didn't believe was coming? Are the prophecies of doom and current events converging? Or is misinterpretation inventing drama where none exists? Time will tell as we monitor the phenomenon we call the Nostradamus effect.